And the judge actually talks about this in this opinion. We're the Arms Attorneys. Today we're talking about breaking news. A federal judge out of the Western District of Texas in Pecos has found another federal gun law unconstitutional. Um, stay tuned, we're gonna be talking about what the case hinges on, what now is unconstitutional, and what happened and why Bruin is just taking down all of these gun laws just brick by brick by brick. But before we get started, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And to kick things off, let's go over the facts very quickly. We have Jose Quiroz, who was under felony indictment for burglary. He attempted to purchase a, a 22 pistol. On the ATF Form 4473, he checked that he was not under felony indictment. He was subsequently indicted again uh, for lying on the ATF Form 4473 and for receiving a firearm. Now, he um, was delayed initially, but the, the FBI didn't respond, and so the firearm transaction actually took place. And so what he did was after he was convicted of these crimes, he appealed and said, hey, I want the court to reconsider my conviction in light of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case, and he challenged the underlying constitutionality of 18 U.S.C. 922, and that's that, when you fill out the Form 4473, those are most of those yes-no questions, mm -hmm. and so that's what we're talking about, the unconstitutionality of that statute, and where do we go from there? Well, this is in the Western District of Texas. I mean, I think, first of all, we can all take a step back and say, God bless Texas, yep. right? Because Texas is taking down all of our gun laws right now, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, but so we have another federal judge in the state of Texas evaluating a federal gun law in light of New York State Pistol and Rifle versus Bruin and saying this is now, I mean, this is an unconstitutional law based on our new standard. So what we have is the government actually... Um, you know, Richard, when we were talking about it earlier, Richard described as sort of the government giving up. And I, yeah. I really agree. I mean, yeah, pretty lazy. Yeah, the do government. Better. <laughs> or don't. <laughs> yeah, don't, okay don't do better. Sorry, I, I would <laughs> strike that, cut that. Um, so what we have is, you know, the government essentially um, trying not to argue on Second Amendment grounds. Yep. Because, again, we've said this before in a video, but I'll say it again. When the government has to justify an anti-gun law on Second Amendment ground, on, on the face of the Second Amendment, based on New York State Pistol and Rifle versus Bruin, they will lose. And they know that. And so here we've got a judge who is doing really, really reasoned analysis about what the restrictions were, what the historical analog, what the history and tradition of firearm regulation looked like at the founding of this country, and why simply being under indictment should not be enough to take away your Second Amendment rights. This is just, it's too exciting, so we just need to start going through it point by point. Richard. Yes, so we are looking at the case under the new framework under the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case. Uh, previously, courts looked at, you know, infringements to the Second Amendment using a two-step framework. Uh, Judge Clarence Thomas said that is one step too many. So we look and we see, does this regulation or this law, does it cover conduct that would be protected by the Second Amendment? And if the answer is yes, we the government needs to provide historical examples, text history and tradition of why the government was allowed to regulate in this area. So to the point there, you know, the government did not do a very good job of laying out their argument in this case. And I really am very grateful for the judge for, you know, really taking the time to draw and do a historical analysis, because if you read this case, I think you'll have a lot of clarity of it might be a little tip off of uh, what, you know, regulation is is to come. Uh, but we, he looks first at uh, when was 18 U.S.C. 922 in enacted, and that was in 1938. It only applied to those under indictment for violent crimes. It was later amended in 1968 to include all felony indictments. You know, the government says 1938. Wow, that is a long-standing <laughs> uh, tradition. Mm, it's not so much. Right. So um, what does, I mean, if we see that there is no real long-standing tradition, um, you know, where does that leave us? It leaves us with the remainder of the points as to why this is unconstitutional, why you cannot deprive someone of their Second Amendment rights for this reason. And I'll just start with what I think the most compelling justification is, yep. which is that indictments are so easy to get. Yep. Right. We've done videos about this before, um, but bear in mind, the defense attorney, no right to be in the room, right? So you do not have any right to pose, you know, mount your defense when you're being indicted. Um, you know, Richard and I, we were prosecutors. We could get cases indicted 
very, very quickly yeah. on, on very little information. It is not hard. And the judge actually talks about this in this opinion. He says, um, you know, it's sort of well known that, you know, a prosecutor can have a burrito indicted, which is the Texas version, by the way, of having a ham sandwich yeah, indicted. I, I guess yeah. so. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, it really is true. Indictment is not conviction. And for me, I really like this because it reminds me of red flag laws because, you know, we have to, when we are drawing lines and that line takes away someone's constitutional right, the line has to be incredibly clear. And so, you know, we've drawn a line under 18 U.S.C. 922 that is if you have been adjudicated mentally defective, right? Yep. And that's why we think that red flag laws are unconstitutional, right? Because you have not yet been adjudicated. We're just moving the line back and taking away more and more people's rights. Um, same goes now with indictments, right? Convicted, well, that's one thing. Right. But once you start moving the line back to indicted, well, the standard is so low. Is it really okay to take someone's constitutional rights away for simply being under indictment? And now we know the answer is no. What jumps out at me is the lack of historical analogs um, because the court, like I said, the court goes in and says, hey, was this area regulated? He does a great deep dive and essentially says, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of unthinkable uh, to remove somebody's right to keep and bear arms or possess arms. You know, that was one of the government's arguments. Oh, this wasn't possession. This is receipt. It's the same thing. You know, there weren't any historical analogies for the government, so they kind of ignored that. The court went and tried to find some um, and kind of came to the conclusion that it was unthinkable to deprive someone of their right to keep and bear arms uh, prior to having some kind of adjudication, especially. Um, and so in the absence of, you know, laws, we have to look at analogies. And I think this is the other thing that jumped out to me was um, he uses the First Amendment. And, you know, obviously the First Amendment, very similar language about the rights of the people and how it can't be infringed. And um, But we still have regulations in those areas. So clearly, you know, there might be a place where, hey, the Second Amendment might be able to be regulated, but it bolsters, I think, the right to keep and bear arms. And he points this out and, and analogizes it more closely with prior restraint. You haven't been convicted of a crime, but now you can't exercise a right. It sounds like uh, the government saying, hey, you can't engage in certain types of speech. Right. It's, it's, it's It sounds a lot like prior restraint. It's an excellent point made. Yeah. And, you know, when he goes in and so he goes and tries to find analogies to try to assist the government and it just bolsters the case for the Second Amendment. And that's kind of what jumped out to me out of the opinion. Oh, yeah. And I know like I know that the the anti-gun folks are already up in arms and you know, someone's going to be out of jail on a murder charge and under indictment for murder, and now they can go buy all the guns they want. But remember, there are still checks, balances, and practical considerations, right? Checks and balances. If you are out on bond for a felony crime, do the conditions of bond let you possess firearms, Richard? No, generally not. Generally not. Almost never. So first of all, you're already violating, you know, I mean, you're going to be back in jail if they find that you're possessing firearms, first of all. So well done, I guess, if you yep. really want to go get yourself thrown back in jail and await trial. So there are already restrictions. And for people who are willing to violate bond, they're also willing to violate the law, right? Oh, yeah. Go buy it in a private sale. Go get it off the black market if you want it so badly. So yep. Really, what we're doing here is, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier, protecting people like the self-defender who find themselves under indictment, not the like, you know, really hardened gang member criminal because they're going to do what they want. Anyway. Yeah. And likely they're going to remain in custody anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we have our people and then, you know, I have I hate when I talk to our clients that, you know, they are in the most dangerous circumstances. They've had to defend them their lives and then they get disarmed and, you know, now they're left helpless. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we're going to paint with big, broad brushstrokes and say, how are we going to treat murderers? Why do we always paint it and box people in for, you know, the acts of criminals? That's never made sense to me. No. And I mean, this really does happen. I mean, imagine you have one firearm to your name, which it, a lot of people are in that situation. You have to defend yourself or your family. You get charged with a crime. You're under indictment. That firearm is evidence. And now you cannot go purchase another one. And not only maybe you're just feeling very insecure about your safety because you've just had to defend your life or the right. life of someone you care about. Um, but also bear in mind that person had friends and family, the guy who's dead now. Yep. And oftentimes they have unsavory friends and family. And the number of times our clients have faced threats from, you know, victims, families and friends and whatnot. I mean, gosh, uh, recently Edwin tried that murder case and the, one of the friends of the victim had to be escorted from the courtroom because he oh, yeah. got so aggressive um, about it. And this is years later. So, I mean, it really is a scary situation and particularly to then have no avenue 
to be able to have a firearm to defend yourself is it must be terrifying yes but we got to come back to the conclusion in this case i'm just going to read it because it's a um you know this is the opinion of the court finding this law unconstitutional the second amendment is not a second class right no longer can courts balance away a constitutional right after Bruin, the government must prove that laws regulating conduct are covered by the Second Amendment's plain text aligned with the nation's historical tradition. The government did not meet its burden. Although not exhaustive, the court's historical survey finds little evidence that 18 U.S.C. 922N, which prohibits those under felony indictment from obtaining a firearm, aligns with this nation's historical tradition. So as a result, this court finds that 18 U.S.C. 922N is unconstitutional. It's ordered that the defendant's motion to reconsider it granted and that the indictment against him is dismissed. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what the conclusion of this case yes. is. Although we should already say the government, the United States has already appealed. Um, so they've already filed their notice of appeal. This will go up to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit is historically pretty friendly to firearms. Yep. Um, so I see this still is a good thing, even on appeal. Yeah, but what's important about this decision is it is just one of maybe five big takeaways from the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case. And now it's kind of a tip off. Where are these other infringements uh, to the Second Amendment going to fall? Thankfully, we have a breakdown of our five big key takeaways to the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case right here. You're going to want to check that out. That is going to tip you off to what gun laws are on the chopping block. And until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.